passage in Scripture, this text from Luke is always the one that comes first to my mind. It's on the top of my list, the road to Emmaus. Maybe it has something to do with the idea that this road, this walk, is symbolically a sign to us about the journey of life. This journey that they're on, it's only one day, a few hours, about seven miles actually to their final destination. But did you notice that they never get to that final destination, at least not the geographical destination. They're on the road to Emmaus, but they never get there. But the journey is one that nonetheless encompasses the whole gamut of human feelings and and uh, emotions, all of the things that are part of life, the lives of those who are on this day on the road to Emmaus, and by extension, our own lives can be included in that story. Have you ever planned for a trip? Hmm? Most of us are familiar with the sense of anticipation that comes when we're getting ready to go on a trip. It's usually associated with something that we're looking forward to. Maybe it's the place that we're going, some place that we've always wanted to see, always wanted to travel to. Maybe it's the people that we're going to see when we get there. Maybe they're friends or relatives or people we haven't seen in a long time. I got an email this week from one of my sisters and both of my sisters from Germany one from Berlin and one from Hamburg, are going to be traveling. They'll be here next weekend with us. And then on their way to San Diego. And she sent me an email this note saying, can you believe it? It's only one more week. That sense of anticipation. And I'm anticipating too, even though we don't have to do any packing for this journey, but we may have to plan a menu or a trip or two, right? But when we're in that process, with that anticipation, we make sure that all our plans are set and all the things that need to happen are in place, that the contacts we need to make are made, and then we set off. Well, that sense of anticipation was a little different for these two travelers, Cleopas and the other disciple who remains unnamed for us. We don't know the motivation for their journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. For all we know, it was the return leg of their, of their journey that they had made to Jerusalem. Good Jews at the time of the Passover made their way to Jerusalem so that they could spend the Passover there at least once in a lifetime but for many, many more times. But now they were headed home, likely, and I don't know if there's a great sense of anticipation. It might more be a sense of dread. They had had some terrible life experiences in this trip to Jerusalem. They had been witness to the events of the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus after his seemingly triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. And now it seems that their hopes, their thoughts, their anticipations had been crushed. They're on their way home to deal with the aftermath of what it means to lose someone they were so close to. Quite possibly, they will be the ones who have to share the news with those in their hometown about what had taken place in Jerusalem during that week. Unless, of course, somebody had already sent a text message or updated their Facebook status. Oh, wait, they didn't have those things back then? <laughs> Never mind. So they've started on their unhappy way, and they're making some progress when they are joined by someone. They're in the midst of their sadness, in the midst of their despair. There's a word of spiritual intervention that takes place. Did you notice it when we read it? This individual joins them on the road, and we all know today it was Jesus. But the spiritual intervention takes place it tells us, it says, their eyes were prevented from recognizing who it was. I think that's amazing. Their whole experience and all their conversation, 
All the things that they're sharing about, all of that is about Jesus and the events that took place in his life. And yet here he comes right next to them and they cannot recognize him. Maybe there are moments in all of our lives when there's a time that we are just not ready to receive God's message into our lives. That we are just not feeling quite ready for what is to come. There are times that we might be wanting to move on to a new stage in our life, to another level, but somehow God knows that we just aren't quite ready. The time is coming, but it's not yet. So our eyes are closed. They may be open. We may be looking. But we do not, we cannot see clearly. Their sadness is also marked by their sense of incredulity. I had to practice my to say that word right. Their, their, their absolute sense of amazement and surprise that this stranger, whom we know to be Jesus, might be the only one in the whole of Jerusalem who apparently doesn't seem to know what took place in the city. Everyone else knows. Sometimes when you're in the middle of the pain that life has brought you, it just seems like everybody else must recognize that as well. Everybody else must be going through that as well. Of course, the reality is a little different. There are some people who are going on with their lives and they have no idea what it is that we're suffering through, that we're going through. And so it was impossible for Cleopas and his other disciple to have any uh, way of, of, of even uh, incorporating the sense that this Jesus, or not Jesus, this man, this person, it is Jesus of course, might not know what they're going through. There's a song from a group group of soul-filled women called Sweet Honey in the Rock. That's the name of the group. It's a group that has been around for years now. You know them. You've heard of them. They're a wonderful group. And through the years, uh, members of that singing group have cycled out and new ones have cycled in. And uh, from time to time that you might go to hear them or see them, you'll say, Oh, you know, it's like it's a whole different group, but their sound is still uh, the same. The message is still the same. And they have a unique a cappella style uh, that just, uh, it just is powerful and has a strong message. One of their songs goes like this. You already said part of it at the beginning of the service. Can't no one know at sunrise how this day is going to end. Can't no one know at sunset if the next day will begin. Let me tell you. That's how it goes on. Let me tell you. When I was in hospice care helping people find the opportunity to talk about their grief, their loss, was so critical. So the opportunity that Jesus gives these two disciples, these two travelers on the road, is invaluable. We need to give folks, and sometimes the folks are the ones that we see if we hold up a mirror. Sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to go through the dark times, to go through the difficult moments and places. We need to give ourselves permission to talk about things in life that we have lost. Hopes, dreams, expectations. The disciples do all of that with Jesus. They share. They share all of that they have experienced. And there are four words that they share in the midst of all that that seem to sum up what has really happened. Those four words are, but we had hoped What are the hopes? What were their hopes? What are your hopes? What are the hopes that you have had that at one point 
seem to, to propel your life and then something happened and it, all of a sudden that's no longer a part of the picture. When we were in hospice care doing bereavement work with the families and looking at what they were going through, we recognized that sometimes the, the, the conversations that we're encouraging are not just about the person that is gone, or the moment that is gone, the relationship that is no more, or the experiences that they had, but it's also a sense of the future is gone. Their hopes have been dashed. Their expectations have been deleted, eliminated, removed. Oh, but we had hoped hmm, so many things that we were going to do. How will we deal with our loss? Who will help us to deal with it? Too often what happens to people who are dealing with loss is that they feel a pressure from other people to move on already. Hmm. Move on to get to someplace else, to get on too quickly. Huh? Sometimes people will say to a, a, a spouse who has lost their, their partner, uh, well, it's been a year already, aren't you doing better by now? Hmm. Well, maybe that's not enough time. Maybe they still need to be on that journey. They still need to share those stories and those moments. We need to take a hold of those cross-bearing experiences where we are carrying our own cross so that we can get to Good Friday and beyond to Easter and look for the resurrection. It happens in our lives. A friend shares the news of his, the death of his sister and we sympathize for a moment and then we change the topic because that's not comfortable to talk about. A colleague shares her disappointment about not getting a particular job promotion. And what do we say? Oh, but at least you still have a job. We see an acquaintance that has gone through a loss. And we just kind of avoid them. Maybe if I go this way, they won't see me and I won't have to ask them or talk to them. Because it's uncomfortable. We don't know what to say in that moment. It's not because we're trying to be callous or insensitive. We, we know the Word of God and we know it not just in our heads, but in our hearts. We know we want to love one another, but we are just at such a loss to deal with someone else's or even our own loss that we feel inadequate. How can we confront this situation? and the darkness in our lives in this world, we want to just go quickly to the light. Not so with Jesus. When we see this story, he, we see that He allows them, He lets them unfold what was going on and share all the things. He is comfortable listening to their stories, listening even long and hard. Did you know that listening is hard work? I can tell you as a chaplain, there are times when I have sat down with somebody and listened to what they were going through, and all that's happened the whole time that I was there is that I was listening. That person did all the talking, and at the end they said, oh, thank you so much for what you do. I'm like, well, wait a second, I didn't, I didn't do anything. <laughs> well, that's not true. <laughs> Spending time listening is hard work. And spending time being present with those who are in need of that presence is not an easy thing, and it's not nothing. And just the same, as, as, as they share their experiences, now Jesus also shares some of his experiences. He shares the biblical story of God's work in history throughout the ages, how again and again God's people whom God loved so much went off the wrong way. How God's heart was broken and kept trying to bring them back and bring them into the right direction. He keeps telling them about how God never gives up on them. And the stories continue so much so that as the disciples gather together later on in the story, they get to a point and say, did not our hearts burn when he was telling us about these things that were going on, should we have not have recognized him then? 
but they don't recognize him then. It's not until they get to their midway destination, to the village where they're going to stop and spend the night, turn into an inn, that's when Jesus really takes action, <coughs> a simple action. Oh, it says that he was going to continue on, or so it seemed, until they said to him, what, come, come, stay with us. Don't be walking out the rest of this way by yourself. It's going to be dark soon. Stay with us. And he responds to their hospitality. And he responds by when, he, when they sit down at the table, that he takes the bread. And as he takes it, he gives thanks. He blesses it. And then he breaks the bread with them in their midst in that moment and gives it to them. And all of a sudden they say, well, wait a second. We've seen this before. We saw this on Monday, Thursday. They didn't call it Monday, Thursday. Then. We saw this the last time we had supper with Jesus. Jesus did the exact same thing. And in that moment their eyes are opened and they recognize Jesus. In the breaking of the bread, it all comes together. Here it is possible for them to see now beyond the pain of what they have gone through. Because this is Jesus breaking bread with them once again, just like he did before he was crucified. Sometimes I think that the most important moment at a funeral service is not the funeral service itself or even the committal that happens afterwards, but the moment when we all come back and join together, maybe for a bite to eat. And I always use this text and say, you know, now in the breaking of the bread, as we break bread together one with another, let us recognize God's presence in our midst. When we get to that point, when we can break bread together and see that it is in each other, in the love that we have, like Peter said, for one another, that we share together in God's love for us, that we can take bread and give thanks, break it and give it, give it back to each other. We have that as an opportunity, as a new pattern in our lives. This is the way that we as Christians, as children of God, live together breaking the bread and sharing it with one another and recognizing in the midst of that that God is present. It's not a reward. It's a gift. It comes to us so that we can be strengthened, so that we can live. Because, friends, the truth is, once we go out that door today, that song is still true. Can't no one know at sunrise how this day is going to end. Can't no one know at sunset how, if the next day will begin. Mm -hmm. We may not know that, but we do know mm -hmm. that there is one who will journey with us and who loves us through the entire stretch of that journey. Amen. 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 May we walk knowing that Jesus walks with us. Amen. In the name Amen. of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs>